Hello and welcome to Diabetes Insipidus versus SIADH. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you, too. So let's talk about where all this nonsense is coming from. Our problems with diabetes insipidus and SIADH, they both come from problems with developing enough or too much antidiuretic hormone in the brain. So it starts in the hypothalamus, then the ADH is secreted by the pituitary, where then it goes down to the kidneys, to the vasculature, etc., to have its effect. Now, if the initial movement of ADH is coming from the brain, then we could anticipate that brain problems, such as a stroke or a head injury or increased intracranial pressure, those kind of things would potentially stimulate one of these problems. So when we're taking a look at our patient, one of the questions to ask is, is there any kind of neurologic disorder here that could be stimulating this to occur? Antidiuretic hormone, okay, the name itself is a little bit confusing. So we have diuresis being the elimination of fluid, and then this hormone is causing our kidneys to not diurese. So if we have antidiuretic hormone, we're not diuresing. If we don't have it, we are diuresing. It's kind of like a double negative. We don't have it, we're diuresing. So here's the normal process that occurs in the body is that we have dehydration that is stimulating the hypothalamus to stimulate the posterior pituitary to create vasopressin, and then vasopressin is going to be moved out into the bloodstream as V1, which causes vasoconstriction, and V2, which causes fluid retention. Also, sympathetic stimulation can cause this process to occur as well. Vasopressin is another name for antidiuretic hormone. In diabetes insipidus, so this is the first of our two problems, we can have this occur in one of three different ways. So in SIADH, we have too much antidiuretic hormone being released. In diabetes insipidus, we don't have enough antidiuretic hormone. So again, think about what that says. We don't have enough, so it's like a double negative. We don't have anti. So in other words, the patient is diuresing. So when you take a look at the symptoms, that follows very well with somebody who's diuresing. Polyuria, thirst, fatigue, dehydration. We can be looking at urine-specific gravity to tell us that the urine is very, is very thin and, and not very concentrated. And again, diabetes insipidus can come from one of three different causes. It can be neurogenic. Again, we talked about the brain and the brain's involvement. It can be nephrogenic. So a nephrogenic anti-diabetes insipidus, uh, what happens there is that the antidiuretic hormone is not having an effect on the kidneys. So the kidneys are resistant to it or breaking it down for whatever reason, antidiuretic hormone isn't causing the kidneys to hang or to not diurese. Psychogenic is another potential, is that we can actually have diabetes insipidus that's caused by severe stress, panic, and psychological type of events. Diagnostically, we would be looking at our serum sodium. We're going to talk more about this in a moment. Our BUN and our serum osmolality. Our serum osmolality is going to be increased because the patient is diuresing like crazy, right? So again, when we're looking at how this thing plays out here, we have the posterior pituitary that is releasing the antidiuretic hormone. It's having its effect on the kidney, or in this case, not. And so the patient is diuresing like crazy here, and we have lots of diuresis. Management would be to detect the clinical underlying condition and then to monitor the urine output, the weight, serum labs, Okay, so we're monitoring our INOs, correct the fluid deficits, hypotonic fluids, maybe fluids would be necessary. And uh, one of those is D5W, by the way, is a hypotonic fluid, even though it's isotonic in the bag. Once you inject it into the patient, 
and the dextrose metabolizes, now it just becomes water, and water is hypotonic. The other side of the coin, then, is SIADH. SIADH can be caused by a neurogenic, again, okay, remember the ADH is coming from the brain, so we can have neurogenic factors where we're inappropriately releasing too much antidiuretic hormone. Could be an ectopic tumor on the kidney that is releasing too much antidiuretic hormone. It could be nephrogenic, it could be pulmonary. So this is one that we don't think about very much. Small cell lung cancers are associated with pulmonary SIADH. Another situation that is associated with pulmonary SIADH is mechanical ventilation, especially those patients who are on high volumes and high pressures on the ventilator. We can see a pulmonary SIADH. Hypoxia, stress, and multifactorial uh, type of events that can occur with an ICU patient. Again, the symptoms, and over to the right, we see that picture again. So here's what's going on. Posterior pituitary, in this case, is releasing too much antidiuretic hormone. We're hanging on to too much fluid, and the patient is not diuresing. So we have oliguria, have decreased urine output. The urine-specific gravity is greater than 1.030. So we have concentrated urine. We have clinical indications of overhydration. So it looks like the patient's got too much water on board. Dyspnea, pulmonary edema. You might see dependent edema as well. Serum sodium is going to be less than 120. Might have some weakness and the muscles and cramps is associated with those electrolyte disorders. Our BUN is decreasing, serum osmolality is decreasing, and we may see a serum ADH level increased, but if only if it's neurogenic. Our treatment is going to be to detect SIADH, monitor our urine output and specific gravity, treat the cause, surgery to remove a malignancy if this is caused by such. And this picture over on the right is showing that tumor, that small cell tumor in the lung that could be causing a pulmonary type of SIADH. Some drugs can uh, cause the patient to have SIADH. They're listed there. So we would discontinue those causative drugs. Correct the fluid volume excess, the electrolyte imbalances, and institute seizure precautions. So how do we determine which is which? This is why we're looking at the serum sodium and the serum osmolality. Urine osmolality, we may not have that right off the top, and actually we may not even have our serum osmolality right off the top. So let's go with what we have. You walk into the patient's room, you've got a serum sodium, a pretty safe bet to say that we're going to get that on a fairly regular basis. And you can take a look at the urine. So our patient's urine and their the urine is concentrated, their serum sodium is high, let's say it's, you know, 140, for example. All right, well, those two things go together. A high serum sodium and concentrated urine go together. Indicates dehydration. Those things fit. But what if the urine is concentrated and then the serum sodium is 125? That doesn't fit. A serum sodium of 125 should indicate somebody who is overhydrated, in which case they should have dilute urine. That's when you look for these problems, is when the serum sodium doesn't fit what the urine osmolality, in other words, concentration, looks like, then you look for these problems. Diabetes insipidus, it's just the opposite. you got a patient who is just diuresing and diuresing. You'd expect that that patient would have a fairly low serum sodium, indicating that they're volume overloaded, but in fact, their serum sodium is high. Those things don't fit. Well, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at diabetes insipidus versus SIADH, and I hope this was helpful to you. Again, look for those things that you can find easily in your patient who has head injuries, in most cases, or your patient maybe who has that lung disorder as well. Look for the serum sodium to fit what the urine looks like. And if it doesn't, consider diabetes versus SIADH. Thanks for joining me this time. Until next time, 